well, those, fo those photo booths, um, the idea behind them is that oftentimes in life we want to capture within our minds a, uh, an image um, of a moment. And that really that's what photos do. I actually sat down, I think coincidentally last night, I wasn't planning on doing this, but uh, years ago my parents had passed on some photos to me of my childhood. And um, I, I don't have a lot of photos of my childhood. My parents weren't really big on taking lots of pictures. They took some. And uh, so my wife, a uh, number of years ago, took all those photos and put them in an album. And I uh, just happened to see it on the bookshelf last night. And so I got it out. And it's about 10 pages or so and just looked at it. And you know, just my childhood, seeing my siblings as little kids and, and all of that. And it was this really wonderful thing because most of the pictures, uh, I could remember it being done. I could remember the event or I could actually remember the photo being taken. And um, so what photos do for us is that they capture a moment. And uh, they don't capture everything about the moment, but they do capture a moment. But what they cannot capture for us oftentimes is the emotion of the moment. It can remind us of it, okay? Photos can remind us of emotion. Photos can remind us of how we felt or what we were thinking. But the photo itself will only capture the image. And then all of that other stuff we find within ourselves. And so our new series here is titled Snapshots from Isaiah. And um, here's the hard part. For us, when we approach a book like the book of Isaiah, is understanding the setting of Isaiah's words. Because what often happens with the book of Isaiah now is that we will um, cherry pick. We will grab a hold of... Uh, just little verses here and there and pieces and say, oh, this applies to this and this to this and this to this. And in reality, we're not having any regard at all for how it was written and why it was written and to whom it was written and the circumstances and all of that stuff. And all of that is so important. And if you've been around here very long, uh, if you've been here more than a, you know, a month or two, you've probably heard me talk about that. We have to understand, we have to seek to understand the context and why something was written. And then when we do, we are so much closer to understanding what God wants for us. We're so much closer to getting at the idea of what he was saying to that person, and then in turn, what does it mean for us? How do we apply that passage as well? And so the context, okay, what's going on, the events surrounding the writing. The context is everything in understanding. So let me give you a phrase here. I'm gonna describe for you the development of a phrase that a lot of us uh, have used in our lifetime. In George Washington days, in George Washington's days, there were no cameras. And so one image, um, if you wanted an image of yourself done, it was either painted or sculpted or drawn. You had to have an artist um, create that for you. And so some of the paintings of George Washington showed him standing behind a desk with one arm behind his back. And so all you could see is from the waist up and one arm and the other arm is, is tucked behind his back. Um, and, uh, and all you can see is from here up. Some images actually show him full body, both arms and both legs, and here's why. Prices charged by painters were not based on how many people were to be painted, but on how many limbs were to be painted. And I talked to an artist about this here this morning because hands and, and arms and legs and feet are difficult and tedious to draw and to paint. And so arms and legs are limbs, and so the more arms and legs you had in the painting, the higher the cost to the buyer. And this developed the expression, okay, but it'll cost you an arm and a leg. Isn't that interesting? Context. And uh, I, all week I was trying to find out if that was true, and I went up to uh, Chris Pauls this morning, who's an artist, and I said, okay, and I gave him the expression, and he's like, oh yeah, that's, I didn't even read the story to him, he told me back the story. Context in that event is everything. Did anybody in this room know that? Chris did. Did anybody prior to five minutes ago know that? Chris, you are brilliant, man. You're well, you are well educated. How about that? Can we go with there? And then you can decide whether you're brilliant, right? Okay. So, but see, see the idea of context. Without the context, you would have no idea. It costs you an arm and a leg. Well, what does that mean? I don't know. My mom said it. My dad said it. My grandparents said it. Everybody says it. So, we know what it means, but we don't know the context of how it developed. And Isaiah so much has that idea within it. So when we begin to study Isaiah, all I'm trying to do today is simply set stage. 
I'm just trying to set for us some sense of what is it that's going on in the life of Isaiah and in the life of Israel and Judah at this point that helps us to understand the rest of this series, the nine weeks or more possibly that will follow this. What is it that we can talk about today that gives us enough background so that when we hear certain things, we kind of have a shared sense of what it means and why it's being said. So here's our first snapshot. Our first snapshot is that of a king. A king, all right? So right off the bat, when I say the word king, you probably have some different images in your mind. And so in the book of Isaiah, there's a theme of king and it dominates the first 37 chapters of Isaiah. There are 66 chapters in this book, by the way. It is long. And so if you sat down to read this, and I really encourage you to read this, it's going to take you all week. You know, read, a, read nine, ten chapters a day, and you will have it done by next Sunday. It is a big, beefy, heavy kind of writing. The first 37 chapters talk about a king so often. And so there's part of our context. There's part of understanding that first snapshot. Oftentimes the king is the Lord himself. And so we get passages like Isaiah chapter 6, 1 to 8, which is a passage we're going to look at later. We look at that passage, and the king is the Lord himself, and it's undis indisputable. It's absolutely, perfectly clear. This is God. But there's other times it's the current king of the house of David. It's the guy who is seated on the throne at that particular moment. And so passages like Isaiah chapter 7, the early part of that, when it talks about a king, it's talking about an actual person who's an actual king of Judah. But sometimes when it talks about the king, it's also talking about a king that's yet to come. We get passages like Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. And, and this, in the future, something that will happen. So here's our question. Is it in Isaiah's future? Because Isaiah is about 700 BC. Or is it our future? Or maybe it's both of our futures. See what I'm saying? There's all kinds of ways that the word king is used and king is talked about here. So my question for us as we start, because you've had a chance now to think about a king, is this, what do kings do? What is it that's the role of a king? Because if we're going to talk about Isaiah and 37 chapters of Isaiah refer to a king periodically, then we probably ought to have in our minds, what is it that a king actually does? And that is so far outside of our experience as 21st century Americans. If you're not, if you weren't born in America, and you were born in a different culture that had somebody that was a king or that type of role, you're way ahead of the rest of us right now. Because your own personal context helps you to understand what a king might be. And so the question is, what is it that a king does? And so as Americans, and this always makes me laugh, and I've seen this my entire lifetime. As Americans, for some reason, there's a lot of us that are fascinated with the British royalty. Personally, I'm not. I, I, I just never have had much of an... You know, I was glad when Prince George was born. I was happy for them, right? But that's about all I needed. I was like, great, baby's born, born healthy, that's wonderful. But for a lot of people in our culture, there's this real fascination, all the way back to the days of Princess Diana and her mar marriage to Charles and their kids being born and now their, one of their sons being married and him having a son born and there's this line of succession now uh, to the throne in England. And, and for some of us in the room, that's a very fascinating Thing, but still our question remains because it's outside of our experience what do kings do and here's my answer it all depends on the character of the king if we're to say this is what a king does well maybe in an ideal situation maybe in a situation that we imagine maybe if we were to put a king in our culture we'd say well this is what we would want a king to do but in reality what kings do all depends on the character of the king. And so here is Isaiah, a prophet. And what we find out is this. We see it at least once, and, and I know it happens more than that, is that he's an advisor to the king. Here Isaiah 1, verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, 
Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. There's four kings listed there. And so what we have here then is Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah's visions from God related to a time frame that encompasses four kings. So let me help you find those kings. If you're to turn to uh, 2 Kings, you might just write this down if you want. 2 Kings, starting in chapter 15, is one of the places you'll find it. In 2 Kings chapter 15, you find Uzziah mentioned. And over in 2 Chronicles, you find a lot about Isaiah. But let's just stay in 2 Kings. He's mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 15 as the father of Jotham. And Jotham is listed in 2 Kings 15. And Ahaz is mentioned in 2 Kings 16. And we get to Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 18. This is the guy that I want to read. Because this is the guy to me that's interesting. And this is the guy that helps us to understand Isaiah a little bit better. It is 2 Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 3. And it says this, speaking of Hezekiah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. See, there's our king in the line of David, the son of David. He removed the high places and he broke down, broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. Okay, so let's just stop for a second. If I just grab those two verses and we read it, right off the bat we're going, I have no idea. What's a shira? What's high places? What's a bronze servant? And what's Nehushtan, right? Did I cover some of your questions? Right, because what's happening here is this, is we're just getting this little snapshot when I read those two verses from 2 Kings chapter 18 of the life of King Hezekiah. But this is what we do know about him, we know this. In spite of the fact that many of his predecessors, those other kings that were mentioned, some of them, the passages say, they did good in the eyes of the Lord. And that's great. I want that said of me, that God looks at me and says, you, you did well with your life. But here's the question. All of his predecessors, it says this. A couple of them, it says, they did good in the eyes of the Lord, but they did not remove the high places. The high places were places of cultic worship. Okay? non-biblical, non-Jewish, turn your heart away from the Lord worship. A couple of those kings listed, it says, they did good in the eyes of the Lord, but they did not tear down the high places. They left all of these pagan practices in place, and people's hearts were led away from the Lord. One of the kings, it says, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he left the high places too. But we get to Hezekiah, and it says this, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he removed the high places, and he broke down the pillars and cut down the Asherah, and even this, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. And this is back in Exodus. This is a big deal. Moses had made this bronze serpent at the command of God, and anybody that looked to it, they were saved from these serpents that had come into the camp, and where people were being bitten, and they were dying from it, and God had given them this incredible gift, but by... Hezekiah's day, it had become an idol. The bronze serpent that Moses had made had become this object that people look in this passage. It says this, For until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called the Nehushtan. It had become an idol. So what do kings do? Depends on the character of the king. Hezekiah, for the most part, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he tore down the high places, the places of pagan worship. And he even destroyed something that was sacred in the history of Israel because it was leading their hearts away from God. They had made this sacred object an idol. And so he was so righteous that he even tore down that and destroyed it, which he should. See what I'm saying? Hezekiah's heart was right before the Lord in so many ways. If you read in 2 Kings chapter 18, you'll find out that Hezekiah was not perfect. Hezekiah made his mistakes. And Hezekiah ultimately lost his kingdom in the nation of Judah, the people of God, Israel, fell eventually. And the prophecy comes in Hezekiah's day that they were going to fall. But Isaiah is writing to his people doing this. 
Isaiah is speaking where a good king should have spoken. That's what Isaiah is doing. What does a king do? A good king leads his people. A righteous king leads his people to God. Were the people getting that? Not really. They got a little bit of that in Hezekiah. A little bit of it in some of the other kings, but not a lot. Isaiah becomes the voice of the Lord. And Isaiah is speaking where a good king should have spoken. So here's our deal. In Isaiah's snapshot, because that's what we're getting today. We're getting ready to read our, this passage. In Isaiah's snapshot, the real king of Judah is greater than even the great king Hezekiah. We start talking about earthly kings. I even gave you the best one that I could find that was listed out of those four, Hezekiah. Hezekiah did right in the eyes of the Lord. Was he perfect? No. But what Isaiah does for us is this, is he says in Isaiah chapter 6, which is where we're going to look, he says this, let me give you an image of the real king. Isaiah 1.1 1, 1 starts off mentioning four kings. And we have something to help us to understand what it means to follow a king. But in Isaiah chapter 6, he says this, let's talk about the real king. Because the real king of Judah is greater than even the great king Hezekiah. I want you to listen to this description. I read for you in 2 Kings 18 a description of Hezekiah, right? He did right in the eyes of the Lord. Listen to this king. It's Isaiah chapter 6 beginning in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraph seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. And with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the vo voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. That's Isaiah's calling. That's Isaiah standing before the real king. There might be kings on the throne in Judah. There might be kings seated in Jerusalem who wear the name and the title of king and function as a king. And they are a king because God allowed them to have kings at their bidding, at their desire. But this is the real king. And look how Isaiah even marks it in verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1. In the year the king Uzziah died. That's an unusual marker in the scriptures because oftentimes you look in First and Second Kings and it'll say, in the second year of Uzziah's reign, in the fourth year of Hezekiah's reign. But that's not what Isaiah says. Isaiah finds in chapter 6, verse 1, and he says this, When Uzziah died, I saw the king seated on the throne. See, there's our context. There's our look at trying to understand what is it then that Isaiah wants us to understand about him. And so he gives us this image in the very best words that he can possibly muster. The very best words that he can draw together in this passage to describe for us what this king, the real king, the Lord, looks like. And what it means for him to be seated on the throne. And what it looks like around him. And I want you to take a few moments and work with the image given to us. I'm just going to mention them. Work with this image that Isaiah gives us. Isaiah tells us how the Lord is enthroned. He tells us how he's dressed. The train or the hem of his robe fills the temple. That's, that's an amazing image, right? 
the train of his robe, the, the, the part that trails behind the hem, fills the entire temple. And the image is one of majesty. Because any king in the eyes of the people of Jerusalem, in the Israelites, looked just like you and me. Any king that they knew, their reference point was a man who stood before them and he might be adorned in a beautiful robe and he might have a train to his robe, something that follows behind, but not one of them had a train that filled the entire temple. You see what Isaiah is doing? It's created an incredible image of majesty. The edges of his robe fill this glorious temple. But you notice this? He makes no attempt to describe for us the image of the Lord himself. He does his best to describe for us how God was clothed, how he is seated on the throne, right? But he doesn't say this, and the Lord looked like. He has no reference point for that. He has no way to describe that to us. He does not possess words, and neither do we, to tell us what God looks like. The best Isaiah could do for us was this. The Lord is seated on his throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The smallest edge of his robe encompassed the entire temple. When I hear that, I get this snapshot. When I read those words and I see that, I think, that's a big king. That's, that's an incredible image that Isaiah is trying to get us to have. And then he just start, starts describing all the things around God. And he says this, Seraphim, or angels, stood above him, wings covering their faces. It's an image of them shielding themselves from God's greatness, right? They're shielding their eyes from the glory of God. And they have wings covering their feet. They are not going to move unless the Lord bids them to move. They are planted firmly in place and they're covering their feet and they're covering their eyes to shield themselves from the glory of God and their wings are flying in constant readiness for God, in constant readiness to be moved by God and then they say this, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. I hear that and I think, wow, he's so caught up in this. It's holy, 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 right? How, how do you emphasize it enough? I want you to get what he's saying here. In the Hebrew language, this happens sometimes. You'll find a repetition of a word to give it this idea of, of intensity. And so in Genesis chapter 14, verse 10, it says this in the Hebrew, pits, pits, P-I-T-S, right? The kind in the ground. I want to give you the right image, right? Pits, pits, right? And so it's translated this way, full of pits. It's this idea of intensity. Or how about this one? 2 Kings 25, verse 15. It says this in the Hebrew, gold, gold. And in a lot of English translations, we render that pure gold. It's this idea of intensity. Listen to Isaiah and listen to what the seraphim are saying. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. It's not just this double repetition. It's a triple. And with every one of them, the intensity goes up. And with every one of them, we get this idea. He's not just holy. And he's not just holy, holy. But it's holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. This is Isaiah listening to these seraphim and all their words are failing because none of their words can capture what they're seeing. None of their words can capture what they're experiencing in this moment. And the very best that they can do with their language is this, is repeat the word again and again and again with the hopes that we understand what this king is really like. And then you see Isaiah's speech being purified, a hot coal purifying his mouth. And you hear the Lord call him, and he responds with these words. Here I am. Send me. Just total submission. The seraphim are waiting to be sent. They're covering their feet. They're covering their eyes. 
and their, their wings are beating. The, the third set are holding them in place, waiting to be sent. And God says, whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here I am. You get the intensity? Send me. It's a powerful passage. And in the power of the passage, it is not based on who Isaiah is. It is based on what he is experiencing at the throne of the king. Our first snapshot from Isaiah is that of the real king of Judah. At best, the kings of Judah might be called good, but none of them are like the Lord. See, all of them would fail in comparison to the great king of creation, and that is exactly what Isaiah has just experienced. That is exactly what Isaiah has just seen. And Isaiah would have no fear of the earthly kings of Judah because he has seen and he has been called by the real king of Judah. And so in Isaiah chapter 6, we see his call. And he gives us this picture of what a real king actually is. And the challenge for us is to view God in a way that is not limited. The challenge for us with this passage is to attempt the very best that we can to remove all of those restrictions from God because when we restrict in our minds what He is and who He is and what He does and what He says and what authority He has, we're removing what is rightfully His. We are taking away from God what is, He is worthy of. Our worship, our respect, our honor. Anytime we hear ourselves say, yeah, God could do that, but we have just diminished God. Anytime that we will put God in some boundaries and say, yeah, but I would do that, but I know God is calling me to that. However, you've just diminished him. You've just shrunk him down in a way that allows you to encompass in your mind what he is and what he ought to be to you. You can do that to an earthly king. You cannot do that to God. And so we get in Isaiah chapter 6 this incredible image of who God is and what he is like. And Isaiah's best attempt and the seraphim's best attempt to describe those things for us. And so this series tackles Isaiah's words for his day. This series tackles what Isaiah was warning them. This series tackles their struggles. It tackles their hope. It tackles their present. It even tackles their future. And this is what I want you to remember as we move through it. The people of Judah, of Israel, were not perfect. They were not perfect. And neither are we. So when you see them fail, be gracious you'd probably fail to, okay? Let's just get that context set for us. When you hear Isaiah warn them, listen to it. Hear the warning. When you hear Isaiah teach them, listen to what he's saying. When Isaiah paints pictures in our minds and gives us these snapshots of what God is like, really pay attention. Because he's trying to give you a gift. And we are no different than the people of Judah. We live in a different time, in a different place, under different circumstances. But we can still hear these words. And so here's my hope. My hope is that we hear Isaiah and we just rightfully apply what he has to say. So let's stand and let's pray about that. God, right now my words seem very, very small, and I know they are. And so just in great simplicity, God, we, we really do ask you. We ask you to help us to read these words. We ask you to help us to imagine what they mean, to um, capture some of the snapshots that they give us, and then just rightfully live them. And so in all the complexity of Isaiah, Father, we pray that we don't get lost in the complexity, but that we just listen intently. In the name of Jesus, we pray.
Amen. Have a great week.